Hello, welcome back to another episode of Corey Hughes' Bloody History. So, the last bunch of episodes have been some recent appearances that I have done. Uh, all of them went pretty well, I think. Um, the book is out, and it's starting to get some uh, publicity. It's got a good reception so far. People appear to like it. Uh, it is available on Amazon. The links are in the description below. Uh, if you're watching this, uh, but if you're listening to this, uh, please go to your, please go to the notes in your podcast app and find the link to a warning from history on Amazon. And please do pick up a copy. You can pick up the ebook for as little as ten dollars. Uh, if you're interested in the ebook, uh, you can go to buymeacoffee.com/jfkbook. Uh, where you can get the ebook, you can also buy my notes if you're interested. I have uh, 650 pages, give or take, of my notes that went into my research for this first book. And also, there's a lot of information in there that's going to be in my future books. So it's it is quite a steal. Uh, but I want to thank everybody who has uh, purchased the book. It's very important to me. Uh, it's the culmination of my life's work, I guess you could say. And so if you have not picked up the book, I'd really appreciate if you did so. Um, like I said, you can go to the link in the description in my notes here. Um, and you can buy from Amazon. Or if you're just interested in the ebook or my notes, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash jfkbook. But um, the one person in the book that people seem to be most fascinated with that people have brought up with me is uh, Carrie Thornley, and for good reason. So um, what we have done before is we have gone through the Carrie Thornley garrison files, and what we're going to begin today is we are going to begin going through Harold Weisberg's uh, Carrie Thornley Files. So, in just giving it a, a brief uh, look here, it appears as though there's a lot of duplication from Garrison's files, but it also appears that there's a lot of uh, handwritten notes by Weisberg in here. Um, Weisberg sent a lot of letters. He communicated in an era uh, when you had to send a damn letter if you had a lot of stuff you needed to get across that people would respond to, I guess. Uh, but he's got a lot of letters in here, communications and stuff like that. And so hopefully we can glean some information from his personal communications and personal notes. Um, I also notice in here there are some like newspaper clippings and whatnot. I, I, I'm not sure we're going to go through all of that stuff. A lot of it seems to be a lot of filler. Um, a lot of the stuff he collected appears to be uh, character development stuff. You know, because remember, character development... Um, is as important as anything else in a murder investigation, right? Uh, understanding a person's personality type, underst understanding how they would react to certain stimuli in certain situations, uh, understanding the psychology of a suspect is just as important as the alleged uh, facts and circumstances surrounding any given incident, right? So... Um, there's about 100 files here, 96, 95, something like that. Um, we're not going to go through all of them, because like I said, some of them are just newspaper articles, uh, some of them are his notes, uh, some of his takes on things. Um, uh, with Weisberg in particular, I find that he would take a very scant piece of information, and he would take it down the deepest rabbit hole, and he would go down these, like, <clears throat> paths of connections and I'm all about paths of connections. They're super important. But some of the paths of connections he would go down would go nowhere. And it just really kind of got me thinking that he didn't really get the gist of what the hell was going on. And he, But I guess back in the day, you know, when was this? In the 1970s, 60s and 70s that Harold Weisberg was investigating. He didn't exactly have Google, right? He couldn't just go pull a PDF file, right? Like I did. He had to go out and he had to, you know, put the rubber to the road or whatever the saying is. And he had to dig up the dots, really, uh, that myself and other investigators, you know, connect in order to come up with some 
some answers. So I, 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 I really give him a lot of credit, but I'm also kind of critical of uh, some of these old school investigators' lack of understanding. But it's, you know, it took goddamn decades for the evidence of the relationships and the significance of the relationships involved, particularly surrounding New Orleans, David Ferry and his crew. It took a long time for a lot of this information to come out, and guys like Harold Weisberg, who actually went out and did the digging for these dots, uh, we owe them a great deal of gratitude. So anytime I am harsh on these guys, just uh, you have permission to ignore me. Um, but all right, so let's begin. Um, NSIA, what is that? That is the uh, National Security Internet Archive. Yeah, that's um, that's how this is labeled under the government's files. So we're beginning with uh, Carrie Wendell Thornley, uh, PDF number one. This appears to be a document. Um, let me see, Memorandum SAC Dallas. It's an FBI document, um, but it indicates that there was some contact uh, involving Dallas Police Department. On this date, Detective Sims, homicide and robbery, Dallas PD, advised he had received information from one J.C. Murdoch, Grand Prairie, Texas, police officer, that one Carrie Thornley, white male, 24, address 1824 Dauphine, New Orleans, Louisiana, was a close friend of Oswald, and served with him in the U.S. Marines at El Toro, California, Marine Base. Murdoch alleges that Thornley is presently a waiter in New Orleans and has recently been in Old Mexico and California with Oswald. Secret Service has been notified. So this is an interesting document. Uh, you know, obviously there's a relationship between Oswald and Thornley. Um, him making the statement that recently they had been in Old Mexico, which is Mexico, right? In California, and he'd been there with Oswald. That's unsubstantiated. I don't believe that happened at all. Uh, I have no evidence of Oswald in California, although it's possible. Because remember, by my own thesis, they were keeping... Oswald out of town, right? They were keeping him tied up doing things, right? Away from New Orleans, away from Dallas and Fort Worth. Keeping him out of the action so they could set him up, right? That's the bulk of my thesis on Oswald in particular. And so uh, Oswald may very well have been in California. You never know. Uh, we just don't have any evidence of it, right? We don't have any evidence of any of Oswald's extracurricular activities, as I will call them. Um, meaning the covert stuff that he was doing when they were obviously keeping him away from the plotters and the setup, right? So uh, Oswald sat in the theater for 30 minutes eating popcorn, right? After meeting with his handler in the Texas theater. That's not the behavior of a guy who's nervous or scared that they're coming for him or anything like that. If he thought that he was being set up, he would already know that his handler knew he was in the Texas theater. Therefore, if he was being set up, his handler would obviously be in on it or he should have made that connection. And that everyone knew where he was, right? So he should have known that that wasn't a safe place if he <clears throat> had been in on any type of assassination plot. So he didn't know anything. He was just sitting in the theater the whole time, right? Because he was kept in the dark. And part of his being kept in the dark was, by my own thesis, he was being flown around the country to do things for whomever, the FBI or whatever, whatever organization he was doing work for. Possibly the alias of Tom Kane is involved here somewhere, but that requires much more research. That's Kane with a K. <clears throat> so... Yes, but this is an interesting document. It, it, it involves Dallas police. Any documents from Dallas that involve our crew in New Orleans are of utmost interest to me. Because in theory, there shouldn't be any connection between our plotters in New Orleans and Dallas as per the um, legal record, right? Other than we know for sure that there was an arrest in October of William Seymour and Lawrence Howard, I believe. I don't remember if Lauren Hall was involved in that. Uh, but they got busted. Um, uh, originally charged with violation of the um, 
Neutralities Act, right? Not supposed to be aiding another country or something like that. And, and they had a bunch of weapons, but that arrest and those charges just disappeared. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I should probably do a show or some research and leaning up to a show uh, on that. Because I find it pretty fascinating. These guys, a month uh, or so before the assassination, a little about five weeks before the assassination, they get busted in Dallas. Or was it Dallas or was it Key West? No, it had to have been in Dallas. It was in Dallas. Uh, but they got, they, got, they got talked to down in Key West also, if I'm not mistaken. There's another incident down in the Keys involving these guys. So, uh, but in Dallas, so they get busted, violating Neutralities Act, arrested. I, mean, I think there was maybe some drugs involved. Maybe they had some pills on them or something like that. Um, but yeah, those charges just dis- disappear. They're gone with the wind. So, um, but yeah, so that all, to me, connects back to the fact that Oswald was just completely in the dark about everything. Being kept out of town, which opens the possibility that he was in California, right? Definitely not in Mexico. No need for him to have been in Mexico. They're not going to send him to Mexico if they're setting him up in Mexico, right? All right. So, what is this? Okay. So, this here looks to be a document about Ronald Schwinghammer. Right off the bat, dated November 26, 63. Really quickly after the assassination. I mean, they, they were on the ball Within two, three days of the assassination, they knew everything about every person that Oswald ever talked to, right? So this is the document. Uh, I discuss this in my book, and I kind of use this to show that uh, Carrie Thornley was uh, involved in intelligence uh, going back to 59 and 60 when he was out in Atsugi. And so uh, this is... Dated November 26, 63, to SAC Dallas from SAC Minneapolis. Subject assassination of President John Kennedy, November 22nd, 63, Dallas, Texas. Military service Lee Harvey Oswald. Ronald A. Schwinghammer, informant. Ronald A. Schwinghammer, Route 1, Albany, Minnesota. Advised SA's Marvin L. Shea and George C. Burton on November 26, 63. Then in 1960, he was assigned to the U.S. Marine Air Control Squadron No. 1, stationed at Atsugi, Japan. Shortly before he arrived at the station, Lee Harvey Oswald, who had been assigned to the same squadron, had been sent home. Schwinghammer said that Oswald had a reputation for being an oddball, a radical, and there was a lot of talk about him even after he left. One member of the squadron who was there when Oswald was there was a professional writer named Rick Thornley. Schwinghammer says that he did not know Oswald but knows that Thornley took copious notes about goings-on in the squadron for the purpose of having material for later writing. Schwinghammer believes that many of Oswald's actions, statements, etc. would have been recorded by Thornley. He said that Thornley later wrote a book called The Idle Warrior, which he tried to have published and which was about the personal, the personnel of uh, MACS, that's Marine Air Control Squadron No. 1. Schwinghammer said that he believes Thornley lives in New Orleans, and since he knew Oswald, he thought the possibility existed that they could have gotten together subsequently to their military discharge. He did not know Thornley's address, but furnished the following possible sources of this information. One, reserve records at the Marine Air uh, Reserve Record uh, Center, Glenview Naval Air Station, Chicago, Illinois. And two, Bud Simcoe, employed by the retail credit company Santa Ana or Fullerton, California. It is not known to Minneapolis office if Thornley has been previously interviewed or if the office at origin, office of origin is interested in the results of such an interview. Accordingly, copies of this airtel are being furnished to the Chicago, Los Angeles, and New Orleans office for the convenience of the office of origin should the location and interview of Thornley be desired. Chicago, Los Angeles, and New Orleans should take no action on the basis of this communication unless requested to do so by Dallas. <clears throat> okay, so a lot going on here, and there might be something in here that I actually missed previously. Uh, let me see if I can revisit this. So we're talking about uh, Ronald A. Schwinghammer. Schwinghammer is in Atsugi in 1960. He knows uh, a person there who goes by the name of Rick Thornley, who he called a professional writer. He said that this Rick Thornley 
took copious notes about the goings-on in the squadron for the purposes of having material for later writing. Hmm. This is in 1960. These writings will go on to be The Idle Warriors, which is written by Cary Thornley. So Cary Thornley is here in Atsugi, 1960. Taking notes about Oswald and his squadron. But the one thing I think that I might have missed here is this sentence here. One member of the squadron who was there when Oswald was there was a professional writer named Rick Thornley. That is not, as far as I know, correct. Because, as per the official story, now, of course, we have to question official stories always, right? As per the official story, Oswald had returned from Atsugi prior to Thornley being deployed there. Hence, where they met in the States at Santa Ana, right? So they meet at Santa Ana. Sergeant Nelson Delgado is uh, interviewed and acknowledges this relationship between them at uh, Santa Ana. And my assumption has always been that that relationship was after Oswald returned from Atsugi, but prior to Thornley's departure for Atsugi. Yet here we have... Ronald Schwinghammer stating that one of the members of the squadron who was, quote, there when Oswald was there, quote, was a professional writer named Rick Thornley. Now, perhaps he is um, referring to the fact that they knew each other at Santa Ana um, or that they knew each other at all. And maybe he's just making an assumption that Thornley was there when Oswald was there, hence they knew each other. And perhaps he's just misunderstanding the relationship, which was uh, only allegedly existent at Santa Ana, at El Toro military base. So, this is now acknowledged and unresolved, yet overall impact of this I think is quite minimal. I think we're all aware that by the time Thornley had made it to Atsugi, he had a relationship with Oswald. We already know that. Um, we will get to, I'm sure, in this huge list of files, thanks to Harold Weisberg, I'm sure we will eventually get to um, alleged relationship between Thornley and Oswald in New Orleans after the fact. So, all right. Um, let me turn the page here. So, Schwinghammer knew about the Idle Warrior way back in the day. It's very interesting. Schwinghammer tells authorities that he believes Thornley lives in New Orleans and he knew Oswald. He thought that they might have had a relationship subsequent to their military discharge. Of course they did, right? Of course they did, right? But um, that is not how things actually play out. <clears throat> uh, he did not know Thornley's address, but furnished the following possible sources of this information. The two sources he gives are pretty interesting. He gives the uh, he gives the information for one reserve records at Marine Records Center, and he, that's a standardized address in Chicago. I'm sure that's pretty obvious, right? That's where there would be information on on Marines. I guess, uh, assuming after their departure from the Marines as well. And then you have uh, Bud Simcoe employed by the retail credit company in Santa Ana or Fullerton, California, which is pretty interesting because there's a couple of things that you can imply from this. Schwinghammer was, uh, was aware of Bud Simcoe, right? Because Kerry Thornley ends up in his affidavit to Jim Garrison, the huge 50-page affidavit, <laughs> uh, the confession, I'll call it from now on. Um, he talks about Bud Simcoe. So the idea that Bud Simcoe 
is actually being mentioned here in this statement by Schwinghammer is pretty significant. So now we have a uh, some secondary confirmation that this Bud Simcoe actually exists. And also for the purposes of narrowing down um, this person's true identity, we have now an employment by the retail credit company, Santa Ana or Fulton, California. Um, Tony, you got that? Uh, so... Bud Simcoe, now we have two people who reference his existence, and we should have two references of employment for him, uh, which should make narrowing down his true identity slightly easier. But at least now I can think we can say for sure that Bud Simcoe is a real person, that Bud happens to be a pen name, nickname, Bud is not his real name. Um, In my book, we go into Bud's possible uh, true identity. Um... But it's pretty interesting here. So that is what we can glean from these from this document. Um, the information from Schwinghammer, reference to the relationship between Thornley and Oswald, and then his reference to Bud Simcoe, which I find also to be very significant uh, in as far as it vindicates the idea that Bud Simcoe is a, is a real person, right? So, all right, moving on. Okay, Um, next document, Gus Beeler. This is an FBI document dated 12-19-63. Gus Beeler, assistant manager, Bourbon House, restaurant and bar, 700 Bourbon Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, stated he does not know Lee Harvey Oswald or Jack Ruby, and to his knowledge, has never met either individual. So, let me pause real quick and just do some commentary here. Uh, What we have is a document. I want to point out the date. December 19th, 63, about three weeks, uh, just under a month, just under four weeks uh, from the assassination. Um, And there's a slew of FBI documents on Carrie Thornley, right? Let me point this out just for general duh purposes, right? So um, the official story says Oswald did this alone. There's no connection to anybody else, blah, 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 blah. Yet within this, you know, month period by December 19th, um, I promise you they had thousands of pages of documents amassed on Kerry Thornley and the relationship between him and Lee Harvey Oswald. I'm sure they had put two and two together that he was in, in uh, Dallas. Uh, I'm, these people are not stupid. They're evil. Remember that. OK, so uh, the investigators themselves, I'm sure after gathering these thousands of pages of documents on Kerry Thornley, were able to very easily figure out exactly what had happened, that he was the one who shot Tippett and all this stuff. Uh, And great efforts were gone to to see that none of that stuff saw the light of day. However, when you go to pull Carrie Thornley's files, you will find a slew of files on Carrie Thornley, mostly not from the FBI. Most of the stuff from the FBI is buried in the totality of the generic files that is called the FBI John F. Kennedy assassination files of which, if I'm not mistaken, totals 16,000, 20,000 pages, something like that. Not much. Um, but there have been different versions of the FBI files over the years. The modern iteration, I think, is 16,000. I think that's the number. But I believe in past iterations, there have been much, much more documents included. So, um, yeah. So I'm just pointing out the fact that according to the official story, despite the fact that Thornley had nothing to do with anything, They just so happen to have thousands of pages of investigation on him. (laughs) Wild. Uh, So let's continue. Gus Beeler advised that after uh, viewing photographs of both Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby, that he could not identify either person as being a patron of the Bourbon House bar. Gus Beeler stated that there has been considerable conversation in the Bourbon House regarding Lee Harvey Oswald, particularly by the wife of Carrie Wendell Thornley. Both Thornley and his wife, according to Beeler, were regular patrons of the restaurant and bar and well known to most of the customers. Thornley and his wife separated about the time of the assassination of President Kennedy and since that time, Mrs. Thornley has been running, quote, running down her husband, quote, and telling everyone who will listen to her that he, Thornley, was a friend of Lee Harvey Oswald. In addition, Beeler advised that Carrie Wendell Thornley has made public statements, statements which have appeared in the local newspaper, that he has either written a book or is writing a book in which he uses Lee Harvey Oswald as a model for the character in the book. Beeler stated that he did not know if this was true, but it has been the subject of conversation in the Bourbon House. Beeler advised that other than the remarks about Carrie Wendell Thornley, which have been passed 
in the Bourbon House, he could think of no other individual frequenting the Bourbon House who might have known Lee Harvey Oswald. <clears throat> okay, so this next page is interesting. It's obviously a photocopy from the Saturday Evening Post dated February 25th, 1964. And it appears to have a quote from Carrie Thornley in it, which is rather interesting. It says, Playwright Miller's statement that it is clear that the one common denominator in all violent acts is the human being reveals at best an astounding ignorance of the biology of other species. At worst, Miller's dogma of violence by necessity is the naked essence of the doctrine of original sin in which Cain believed and the doctrine of historical necessity in which Oswald believed. Whenever man has initiated violence against man, it has been with some form of that dogma as common denominator and as justification. Carrie Thornley, Arlington, Virginia. Rather interesting, wouldn't you say? So back in this era, uh, it was very common. Was it 64? Yeah. Back in this era, it was very common to pass messages in in newspapers and magazines. I wonder if this is something along those lines. <clears throat> All right. Moving on. Memorandum to Mr. W.C. Sullivan from W.A. Brannigan, subject, Lee Harvey Oswald, internal security, Russia, Cuba. I don't see a date on here. The New Classics House, Chicago, Illinois, recently sent to the director a copy of a book entitled, quote, Oswald by Carrie Thornley. Uh, that must place this in the 70s sometime. Oh, wait a minute, here we have a date, 518.65. Oh, that book, Oswald, wasn't written at that point, I didn't think. Oh, well. Uh, Carrie Thornley was a former associate of Lee Harvey Oswald at a marine base near El Toro, California, during the approximate period April 1959 to June of 1959. During that period, Thornley was in frequent contact with Oswald, but did not associate with him off the base, nor was he a close friend of Oswald. Following Thornley's discharge from the Marine Corps, Thornley worked as a doorman and waiter and wrote a book entitled The Idle Warriors. Based upon his experiences in the Marine Corps, he was unable to obtain a publisher for the book. However, following the assassination, Thornley decided the main character in his book closely resembled Oswald in philosophy and actions and is now trying to interest publishers in the book. In the current book entitled Oswald, Thornley uses several chapters from The Idle Warriors in an effort to embellish his knowledge of and his association with Oswald. In his current book entitled Oswald, Thornley does not produce any facts concerning Oswald that were not brought out during our investigation of Oswald. Much of his effort is spent in psychoanalyzing Oswald and speculating as to Oswald's motives for the assassination and his plans for the future had he escaped. Thornley is of the objective, either in the United States or in Russia, some fame through killing President Kennedy. Thornley feels that Oswald would never have confessed to the crime, but would have maintained he was innocent to the very end. The final chapter of Thornley's book is merely a report of his testimony before the Warren Commission. In his testimony, he refers to the fact that he had been interviewed by the FBI, but does not elaborate on his testimony, nor is he at all critical of the FBI. Observations. This book by Thornley is not a good piece of literature. <laughs> oh, I got to reread that. Observations. This book by Thornley is not a good piece of literature. Uh, the enclosure, uh, next page, uh, language in the book at times is raw, and there does not even seem to be any continuity of contents. It sells for 75 cents a copy in paperback form and appears to be an effort by Thornley and the publisher to make a quick financial killing. It is highly doubtful if it will achieve this purpose. Action. 
For information, a copy of the book is attached. <laughs> Fucking crack me up. God damn. Oh, that's good. <laughs> oh, shit. All right. So it looks like we got a bunch of pages of, like, um, clippings and envelopes and other other nonsense. A bunch of articles I'm not going to read through because Weisberg had a goddamn habit of clipping the most... He would clip like 15 pages and highlight like three quarters of it. And then fucking only one sentence from the whole fucking article would have any like relevance to anything. It'd be fucking hilarious. Um, so he has copied the draft in Daniel Webster. Um, looks like it's from Innovator Magazine. Uh, April 19... What fuck? 1966. Oh. And flipping through this, um, it looks like a bunch of nothing. Okay, the okay, this is what I'm gonna take a wild guess at. All right, somewhere the innovator somehow published an article by Carrie Thornley, and therefore Harold fucking Weisberg felt the need to like photocopy every single thing that they ever did looking for it. Um, I'm sure it has something to do with that, but there's nothing relevant that I can see in any of this innovator stuff other than I'm willing to bet it has to do with Carrie Thornley's publishing articles post-assassination. Weisberg was heavy into that weird shit. Like, fucking, if you were a suspect and you owned a dog, you'd go into, like, your fucking history of what dogs you owned. I swear to God, the guy just went off the, off the deep end at times. And this becomes super obvious when you read, like, his personal communications. I'm, I think there's a couple in here, but, like, You'll you'll see when I get to when I get to one of them, fucking guy. There's like there's being thorough, and then there's being like I'm fucking jacked up on Adderall and been up for four days, and I'm going off the deep end, fucking thorough, right? Like, yeah. <clears throat> All right, what do we got here? We got some handwritten notes by Mister Harold Weisberg. Oh my god. Um. This looks like a collection of various quotes about Thornley mentions Marina in here. All right, this might be juicy. So let me zoom in here so I can actually get the gist of this. All right, July 15th, 1966, KEWB, Joe Dolan and Carrie Thornley. Thornley and Dolan then underlined. I don't know if this is a conversation. It must be because it has D and T repeated with quotes in it. So yeah, let's assume this is a conversation between Joe Dolan and Carrie Thornley. Starting with Mr. Dolan. Uh, He never learned to drive a car, did he? Thornley. Uh, that's uh, what I'm told. Uh, strangely enough, his uh, favorite book was 1984. In my own mind, I had labeled him as a uh, parlor communist. Then on Oswald's rifle capacity, Thornley, quote, he had a marksman's medal, I am told. It meant that he was a better shot than the average man. However... Uh, I later had a change, a chance to visit Dallas after the assassination. I think it would have been an easy shot. Dolan, uh, he had a, um, well, I can't read what that says. A something rifle and a telescopic sight. How do you explain that? Well, I've never fired with a telescopic sight, so I couldn't, I wouldn't, I couldn't tell there. Ah, let me pause right here. That's kind of interesting because if you'll remember, uh, if you've uh, listened to my show before in discussing Thornley and his setup of Oswald, he was seen off of the aqueduct in Fort Worth shooting from stabilizing with bales of hay off targets that were set up against the side of the aqueduct, right? And that witness said that the rifle had a telescopic sight. So, even no matter how obscure an interview would be, something like this, like why would he, why would he bring this up? He says, "Well, I've never fired with a telescopic sight. I couldn't tell there." Why would he say that? 
We know that he has. He has fired with a telescopic sight, which is, I believe, why he is specifically saying that he didn't. It's little things like this. It's little teeny tiny unconscious statements. And I guess you could say other unconscious actions that give people away, right? If he's never done it, why is he specifically stating he's never done it? You wouldn't do that. That's not how people talk. That's not how the psychology of conversation in the moment and the flow works. Well, I've never fired with a telescopic sight. I couldn't tell there. That's a guilty conscience talking. Dolan, telescopic sight jumps, uh, and this uh, takes a bit of seeking. Thornley, I would have been next. It would have been next to impossible to fire off the shots in time. Dylan, of course you didn't know Marina. Thornley, no, I didn't. Bullshit, bullshit. See, I don't. This is like I'm seeing repeated lies, spe- very specific repeated lies in this interview or conversation between Thornley and Dolan. Why would they bring... He's brought up two very specific things that Thornley most certainly did that he's giving him a chance to deny. Why? Why is that? I don't understand the psychology behind this conversation. What is going on here? What prescient questions to be asking by Mr. Dolan? Of course you didn't know Marina. <clears throat> Thornley, no I didn't. Then Dolan says on how Oswald would escape detection as a communist. Thornley said, this is a point where I have to disagree with the critics. Um, looks like something blank, pink in our sympathies. I summed it up in my book, You Don't Train. Looks like there's words that have been redacted here or just they're smudged out or something. You don't train blank and go over and be an ambassador. Oh, okay. So he's saying along the lines of, I summed it up in my book, You Don't Train, and I'm, I'm just going to fill, I'm going to make some stuff up here, okay? You don't train to kill and then go to be an ambassador, right? So like... I think that's along the lines of what he's trying to say here. But I don't know why these words are smudged out. It doesn't make any sense. Thornley. <clears throat> uh, Marine Air Control Squadron discipline was very lax in this outfit. Oh, Marine Air Squadron 1 discipline was very lax in this outfit. Marine Air Squadron 1 was uh, the squadron that Oswald had been in in Atsugi. And then that Thornley was in after Oswald had left at Atsugi. But remember, between these times, they knew each other in Santa Ana. Uh, Dolan, would you think of committing? I can't read that smudged out. Would you think of committing something? Thornley, I have no reason to think in is in the something on it. This is a, I can't read any of this. Something about judging a man. Tucker must be talking about Oswald again. Have you had any contact with Marguerite Oswald? And then Thornley says, Marguerite Oswald sent me a letter. That's interesting. Um, After reading about me, she read about the Idle Warriors. I turned it over to a gentleman who was acting as my agent. Letter request by Marguerite Oswald. Dolan, what do you think of the conjecture on Warren Report? Thornley, when Warren Report came out, I used it for research for my book. When the 26 volumes came out and I scanned those, now I'm very skeptical. Right now, I'm thinking he was probably framed. I have not read any of the books of the critics. Any knowledge of them comes secondhand 
uh, testimony of Roger Craig. Testimony of Roger Craig, page 157 of Bantam Issue. Uh, this created doubts on a Craig identif on Craig identification of Oswald. Okay, this is great. Okay, so uh, any knowledge of them comes secondhand. And then test from testimony of Roger Craig, page one fifty one of Bantam Issue. This created doubts on Craig's identification of Oswald. Boom boom, because it wasn't Oswald; it was William Seymour. William Seymour. So Kerry Thornley is more dropping hints, right? This guy just loves to like drop hints. He's telling the story. If you follow everything that he says, um, over the years, he just, it's a big confession and that's it. Uh, Dolan, do you think Lane talking about Mark Lane should have been appointed to defend Oswald Thornley? No, I don't. I don't think, the Warren Commission should have been convened. I think the government should have stayed out of it completely. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Dolan on Oswald as a patsy. Thornley uh, said it was on uh, said it was on television. Quote: It was. I can't state what that says. It was out off uh, on a number of stations. It was cut off on a number of stations. Uh, Dolan on Ruby Thornley he said high government officials were involved uh, and then Dolan on Marina's testimony Thornley from what I gather of Marina and this is all secondhand mm -hmm, uh, she wasn't the innocent girl we all thought of of course not of course not so do you see what Thornley's doing in this group in this brief uh, interview or questioning between him and Mr. Who was it, Mr. Dolan? Um, Mr. J uh, Joe Dolan and Carrie Thornley, right? So he just, just he keeps dro he loves to drop the fact that he knows more than anybody else. This is like the ultimate narcissist. Like, if you have any trouble understanding what narcissism is, like it's Carrie Thornley is the embodiment of it, undoubtedly. So, all right. Moving on. See, this is this is fascinating stuff, and this is great stuff. This is stuff that never turns up in like you know other people's books or anything like that, right? But what are we doing here? What are we doing about what is this? What what? How does this help us in any way? This does a couple things. The first thing it does is that it, it, it gives us more character development of Carrie Thornley, right? We get to see a deeper insight into the narcissistic personality of Carrie Thornley, and we also get to see from the horse's mouth. Um, exactly what he had intimate knowledge of and what he didn't. Because all the things that he specifically denied here, you can state that he was involved, right? So he says, well, I never fired with a telescopic sight, so I couldn't tell you there. Why would that even come up? Why would he even say that? There's no need to. He doth protest too much. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. Uh, Gary Thornley, despite how smart he thinks he is, he's really kind of stupid. All right, moving on. All right, now we got this like 13 page article. I don't think we're going to touch this. We're just going to skip it. Um, this looks up, this it appears to have a bunch of statements made by a bunch of people who were involved in the assassination or the invest, post assassination investigation, one way, shape, or form. Um, I'm not seeing anything referencing Kerry Thornley, so we're going to skip it. <clears throat> All right, what is this? Uh, this appears to be a letter to Mr. Kerry Thornley. Oh, from Hal Verb. Okay, it's from Hal Verb. Let me see if I can zoom in on this and read some of this tiny little writing here. Some of this writing appears to be similar handwriting in the margins of... Oh, yeah, this is Weisberg's, duh. Okay, this is Weisberg stuff, so of course it's going to have Weisberg's handwriting on it. <laughs> All right, note, this referred to Oswald as having a crypto clearance. Notice that Thornley, in his reply, undated, said in his reply, quote, the same theory has occurred to me. And that's from Hal Verb. Okay, so... Um, Kerry Thornley, 909 West 77th Street, Los Angeles, California, 90044. Dear Mr. Thornley, David Welsh of Rampart Magazine suggested that I contact you. I had asked him 
to look you up when he visited Los Angeles recently and discuss something I came across concerning Oswald just before he was discharged. Dave told me that he discussed this with you. I don't know whether Dave asked you or not, but I was interested in obtaining a roster or list of Oswald in his unit uh, when he was in the Marine Corps just before he was discharged. Is it possible that you may have one on hand, or would you know how to obtain one? This would be very valuable indeed for the particular thing I'm checking out. Perhaps you might know the names and addresses of some of the persons he was stationed with. If you could help me out in this way, uh, I'd very much appreciate it. Incidentally, I hoped to be in L.A. in the near future, and perhaps we can get together and discuss this further. I also hope to see David Lifton, who is a good friend of mine, when I'm there. If you see him, say hello for me. And that's from Hal Verb. Hal Verb is a uh, well-known or somewhat well-known of the era um Kennedy researcher. Moving on. <clears throat> August uh, 29th, 1967, memorandum to Tom Bethel from Jim Garrison. I noticed that in the phone book, uh, there is an Emil Barr listed at 1925 Dauphine Street. It sticks in my mind that Kerry Thornley lived in this block when he was in New Orleans. Carrie Thornley, spelt C-A-R-Y, uh, was seen in Oswald's company in the Bourbon House one night by Barbara Reed. Is this the same bar, B-A-R-R-E, listed in Oswald's notebook and who may be a relative of his? Can we corroborate Carrie Thornley's address while in New Orleans? That's, that is interesting enough for me to take a fresh screenshot of and send off to my tiny research group. All right, moving on. Um, this appears to be a bunch of newspaper clippings. DA subpoenas Oswald's pal. Okay, so we'll we'll take a look at this. Uh, this is from volume ninety one, number one eighty two, Tuesday, January 9th, nineteen sixty eight. Uh, the New Orleans States item. A Marine Corps associate of Lee Harvey Oswald was subpoenaed today by District Attorney Jim Garrison in his probe of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Uh, Criminal District Judge Matthew S. Braniff is issued the subpoena. For Kerry Wendell Thornley, formerly of New Orleans and now of Tampa, Florida, Thornley was questioned extensively by the Warren Commission in his investigation of the assassination. Uh, the commission described him at the, uh, as the closest Marine Corps friend of the accused assassin. Thornley lived here in 1963 at 1824 Dauphine. The DA's office said it wanted to question him about what it called contacts with Oswald during this period. The subpoena is for an appearance before the Orleans... Uh, Parish Grand Jury, February 8th and 9th. The request for the subpoena says the Warren Commission questioned Thornley for, quote, 33 pages concerning his Marine Corps life with Oswald, but did not question him about knowing Oswald in New Orleans in 1963. The DA's office claims to have established that uh, Thornley was seen in Oswald's company in the French Quarter and elsewhere before Oswald's final departure from the city in 1963. The office said the frequency of Oswald's contacts with Thornley here indicate the latter might be in possession of specific information about other associations Oswald had in this period. The subpoena grants Thornley immunity from arrest for any past offenses during his stay uh, to answer it. A request that the subpoena be served will be presented to a judge by Hillsborough County, Florida, Tampa, uh, a check for $148 was ordered drawn from the fines and fees fund by Judge Brantliff to pay for Thornley's trip. At the time of the assassination, Thornley was working as a waiter in New Orleans, interviewed by the state's item on November 27, 1963. 
He described Oswald as sort of a poor soul. Thornley said that he served with Oswald Marine Air Control Squadron Number 9 at El Toro Marine Air Base, Santa, Santa Ana, California, in the early months of 1959. He was so impressed with Oswald, he wrote a book based on his life called The Idle Warriors. The book apparently was never published. Thornley described the Marine Oswald as a kind of outfit janitor because he had lost his security clearance for being in the brig. He had a reputation in the outfit for being a real loser. He supported the Warren Commission's thesis disputed by Garrison that Oswald was a communist. He said, I uh, think Oswald became a communist before he became a Marine. Thornley said a mutual interest in books and uh, bull sessions drew him to Oswald. Uh, he was very well read and I read a lot. Uh, we'd get together in the afternoon. He and I and six or seven others, we'd discuss politics and religion and such. Uh, he said he thought communism was the best religion, but there was always this satirical half mocking attitude he took. You couldn't tell whether he was really being serious or not. Asked if he thought Oswald, uh, was the assassin type. Thornley said, well, he was very re resentful of the military he was very much, quote, the man who would play the part of the assassin. But I'm not sure he ever uh, committed the I'm not sure he committed the assassination. He never showed any tendency toward violence. He was more a talker than anything else. Interesting. All right. So this article here, um, let me see from date is cut off. I can't read it. Uh, Carrie W. Thornley, 29, reads a news story saying New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison had subpoenaed him to testify in the probe of President Kennedy's assassination. He said he did not plan to answer the subpoena unless extradition proceedings required him to go. So this is one of the single best pictures of Thornley um, as it relates to his resembling Lee Harvey Oswald. Let me screenshot this thing. That is one of the clearest images showing the receding hairline, uh, how he very closely resembled Oswald and the part and everything. Um, won't voluntarily go, says Tampa Man. The district attorney's office Tuesday issued a subpoena for a Marine Corps buddy of Lee Harvey Oswald, apparently, to ask questions it feels the Warren Commission should have asked. Criminal District Court Judge Matthew S. Braniff issued the subpoena for Carol Wenley Thornley, South Tampa, Florida, after it was presented by Assistant District Attorney Richard V. Burris. Uh, the subpoena says Commission Attorneys questioned Thornley for 33 pages about his knowledge of Oswald in the Marine Corps in 1959, but did not question him about what the DA's office termed Thornley's, quote, association with Oswald in New Orleans in 1963. Ooh, so it appears here that they were well aware that Oswald and Thornley knew each other in 63. It's fascinating. Thornley contacted at his home in Tampa, told the Associated Press that he has not planned to honor the subpoena unless he is formally extradited. Uh, he said he knew Oswald about three months when both were stationed in El Toro, California with Marine Air Patrol Squadron Number 9. The frequency of Mr. Thornley's contacts with Oswald in New Orleans also indicates that he might be in possession of specific information concerning other associations, which this office has found Oswald to have during this period in New Orleans, Burns said in one part of the subpoena. Bonds are set. Meanwhile, Thursday, bonds were set in a criminal district court for Vernon W. Bundy on charges of armed robbery and theft. Bundy, a 29-year-old Negro whose address was listed as 4039 Athos Court, was one of the state's major witnesses in a hearing in which three judges ruled that Clay Shaw should be held over for trial on charges of conspiring to kill President Kennedy. Shaw was later indicted by the Orleans Parish Grand Jury on this charge. Uh, Bundy testified that he saw Shaw and Oswald together. All right. <clears throat> Uh, continuing, uh, Garrison subpoenas buddy of Oswald, New Orleans, a close Marine Corps friend of Lee Oswald, uh, was subpoenaed yesterday by District Attorney Jim Garrison in his probe into an alleged plot to assassinate President Kennedy. The subpoena was issued for Carrie Wendell Thornley, formerly of New Orleans and now living in Tampa, Florida. 
who had been questioned closely by the Warren Commission about his Marine Corps life with Oswald, but not about their contact here in 1963. Garrison said he wants to explore that period, and that his office had established that Thornley was seen with Oswald in the French Quarter before Oswald's final departure in September of 1963. The Warren Commission concluded that Oswald, acting alone, shot the president in November of 1963. The subpoena grants Thornley immunity from arrest from any past offenses during his stay in New Orleans. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Article from January 10th, 1968. No reference here to the publication. Um, Pal, quote, never saw Oswald after 59. Kerry Thornley, Marine Corps companion of Lee Harvey Oswald, said today he never saw the accused presidential assassin again after July of 1959 when he was uh, mustered out of the service. Thornley, in a telephone conversation from South Tampa, Florida, said he declined to cooperate in District Attorney Jim Garrison's probe of the slaying of President John F. Kennedy because he, quote, lacks confidence in the D.A., uh, Garrison has subpoenaed Thornley to appear before Orleans Parish Grand Jury February 8th and 9th, but Thornley says he will fight extradition. A spokesman for the district attorney's office told the Thornley statement that he never saw Oswald in New Orleans. He said that, quote, we have at least six witnesses who saw Thornley and Oswald together in New Orleans during the summer of 1963. That is an ultra important quote. Keep that in mind. Quote, we have at least six witnesses who saw Thornley and Oswald together in New Orleans during the summer of 1963. Uh, the DA contends that Thornley was associated with Oswald in New Orleans during the summer of 1963 when Thornley was working as a waiter in the French Quarter and Oswald was living on Magazine Street. Thornley today denied this. Um, Garrison subpoena for Thornley was the fifth issued with his probe of the Kennedy assassination. Garrison's request for the subpoena of Thornley said Thornley was questioned by the Warren Commission for 33 pages concerning his Marine Corps life with Oswald. Garrison said Thornley told an interviewer from the commission that he never saw Oswald after their duty with the Marines. However, Garrison said he had information that Thornley was one of Oswald's, quote, more consistent companions, quote, in New Orleans prior to Oswald's departure from New Orleans in late September of 1963. Garrison added that the frequency of Oswald's contacts with Thornley here in, indicated the latter might have, been, might have specific information about other associations Oswald had in 1963. Garrison's subpoena asked that Thornley be granted immunity from arrest for any past offenses during his stay in New Orleans and also asked authorization to pay Thornley $148 to cover his expenses in coming to New Orleans. Thornley told newsmen that he knew Oswald about three months uh, when both were stationed at El Toro, California with Marine Air uh, patrol squadron number nine but he said that the friendship ended when they had a short argument one day over a parade starting time that's new uh, Thornley said Oswald at that time was a the target of constantly of his political and religious beliefs everybody in the outfit put him down as a communist and an atheist Thornley said of Oswald Thornley, 29, who calls himself a freelance writer, said he wrote an unpublished book prior to the assassination of President Kennedy titled The Idle Warriors, in which he mentioned Oswald as one of a number of disenchanted military men who had fled the United States. All right. Okay, so it looks as though we are coming to an interview of Thornley, a very lengthy interview of Thornley, held by Channel 13, WTVT-TV, Tampa, Florida, January 1968. 30-minute interview. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to call it for today right here. Uh, we're going to pick this back up in the next couple days. Uh, so be sure to tune in for the Kerry Thornley, uh, Harold Weisberg Files, Part 2. All right, guys, thank you very much. And if you haven't bought my book yet, please click the link down below uh, and you will uh, it will take you to Amazon and you can buy a copy there. All right. So thank you. Uh, and I will see you guys next time.